Well, good morning there. Friends, um, I hope that uh, <laughs> you have your seat belts fastened this morning. Oh, it may not be that bad. Um, welcome, everyone. It's great to see uh, you here uh, again. And uh, surprising, I suppose, being that I've been um, not quite myself <laughs> Over the past couple of weeks, and hopefully um, I'll explain why today, um, if you're not familiar with the story. And uh, I'm just going to give you kind of a quick update on things that are going on, where things are, uh, and some observations about the world. Float out some ideas that I've had over the last couple of weeks, um, <laughs> and then we'll call it good. I recognize this isn't um, kind of the normal thing that I do, but um, when I consider doing just like a rant today, like there was a number of times this last week that I almost just randomly jumped in with a rant, and inevitably, I think the timing was just off. Um, there was, uh, you know, somebody else doing a stream, and I try not to cover up anybody else, I try not to sp split the crowd, right? Uh, so uh, either something was going on, or I just didn't have a time to really do it, or I couldn't quite fully elucidate the thoughts that I wanted to. Uh, but there was numerous times in the last uh, week um, or two, but certainly this last week, where I just kind of wanted to get together with the family and say, God, would you... You just can't believe this shit, man. <laughs> you just would not believe what's going on. Uh, but uh, in any case, and I think it's indicative of the world. And again, many times we just kind of have to look at these things and just sort of laugh and go, what the hell? Uh, but in the interim, um, welcome, Dark Glasses Woody. Thanks for being here first. And uh, Doc Michael, who was almost first, but second. Nemo, great to see you, my friend. Um, I've missed you. It's, uh, it's good to see you. Same with you, Sue. I've missed you, my friend. I, I apologize. I have been um, fairly poor of late of getting back with people in a timely manner, um, and I apologize. Again, it is not um, from desire. It is um, largely from the situation I find myself in, and we'll cover that in more detail. Ronald Lee, always a pleasure, my friend. It's so great to um, receive emails and cards and gifts. You're just the best ever. Uh, well, except Jenny Spark, who is also the best ever. How do we get all the best together? Uh, but Jenny, if you haven't checked out Jenny Spark's um, program, Shaking Hands with Ch Strangers, um, it is amazing. And so you want to check that out, especially if you're in her neck of the woods. Spicy Sarah and uh, <laughs> her and PRD, uh, Hottest couple on the internet. That's right. Uh, Rob Cleveland, great to see you, my friend. Uh, Mojo Shop, always, uh, always a pleasure. Flat Earthship Bear, knocking it out of the park up there with that uh, Flat Earthship up there in BC. Um, kind of jealous. My wife and I were talking about, uh, talking about. I was showing some of her, some of the pictures of your progress, and she was pretty impressed. Um, David Rife, great to see you, my friend. As always, um, David is an amazing guy in our community. If you are not familiar with him, he'll give you his email address at the drop of a hat. Um, and just for somebody to talk to and hang out with, and he's good for that because um, David's got a lot of a lot of depth um, as an individual, and um, he and I have a lot of a lot in common. We've gone through a whole bunch of stuff, um, similar circumstances, and um, we see things in. Um, Similar ways often. Uh, Doc Michael, of course, is here. This is uh, Liz, the Iron Maiden, who is awesome. Iron Realm Media, if you guys are not familiar with that channel, uh, it's the best kept secret on the interwebs. Go over there twice a week at least, and you can uh, catch uh, all the background stuff. See, that's kind of where all the content creators go to hang out and get our ideas. And <laughs> we take those ideas out into the world. Uh, Flat Accord Music, uh, great to see you, my friend. Stephanie Martin, uh, Morgan, and... Uh, all of our friends. If I missed you, sorry about that, Clayton. I see you there. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to say hi to the folks. Um, and um, it's again, the, you're why I come here, you know, week after week. Um, lungs, how are you? Um, so this is, uh, we are the best, Sue. Absolutely. And I, boy, have I missed you guys this, this week, um, in particular, last couple of weeks, definitely. But uh, it has been a journey. Uh, there's no question. <clears throat> so let's see, where did we leave off last? <laughs> Somebody help me out. <laughs> Oh, what a nightmare this has been. Oh, great. Jeopardy Jeebers. Mm. All right. So um, I don't really have... Um, I don't really have a way to do this um, do this justice, but I can try, try to do it you know, as a little story. So, you know, we'll start... Um, well, I'll tell you what. Er, we'll start here. Um, so you're probably familiar, um, unless you've been living under a rock, um, with uh, 1993 movie um, st starring um, Michael, um, uh, what's his name? <laughs> you know, <laughs> th this guy. Anyway, um, Michael Douglas, yeah. So uh, Falling Down, 1993 movie, uh, uh, you know, a tale uh, of... Um, uh, useless reality, and uh, it's a it's an interesting um, an interesting take. I, I see I've seen memes recently 
uh, let's say, you know, my 20-year-old self didn't understand this movie, but my 35-year-old self does or whatever. I don't know. In 1993, I was in my early 20s, and um, I immediately went, oh, crap, this is, this, this is going to be the story of my life. Um, and the, the basic, you know, the, the basic premise of this movie is that you've got, um, you know, Michael Douglas and he's a, he's a nerd. Um, and so, you know, identified with that, certainly not the hair probably, but the glasses and, um, he's, he's somewhat, uh, bedraggled. He's had a, he's just had a crappy day, right? Um, it's just a series of small incidents, uh, a, a traffic jam and he's late to work and his boss is up his butt and he just needs to get to work and he's just freaking out and it's, he and his wife are going through a nasty divorce with um, custody battle. People won't call him back, just one thing after another. And there's this iconic scene in which, um, kind of the name of the movie, this is where it begins to happen, is, and he goes into a breakfast, and it's presumably McDonald's, but they don't call it that. And it's 5 of 10, and he wants a breakfast, and they're already serving lunch. Well, we start serving you know, lunch at 10, but it's 9.55. I just, I just want breakfast. And the, the kid just, you know, but, uh, but, but, we, but we've already started serving lunch. And um, he, he's had quite enough. <laughs> and, and this is where it um, begins to break down. And once the, once the dominoes have begun falling, there's no stopping it. Um, and I identify with this, um, you know, in a, in a number of ways. And... Um, I had a week similar to that. Hopefully, my my um, hopefully my handling of it was slightly better. We'll we'll see what you think. All right, let's let's start again with the pretty music. <laughs> okay, the incident. All right, so uh, this all began two weeks ago. Well, it, okay, it began um, further back than that. So this actually began, you know, as you know, if you've been listening months ago, I've been having. Um, unknown health issues, GI stuff, all kinds of nonsense, and can't seem to get it figured out. And it's been a drag, and it's, um, it's, it's annoying, right? And it gets in the way of all kinds of stuff. So um, such was the case. Um, and some days are better than others. I'm, I'll go three or four days without it being too bad, and then I'll go a weekend or a few days, and it's just a nightmare. Well, such was the case a couple of weeks back over the weekend, um, 17th and 18th, just brutal. Um, lots of vomiting and just uh, just wasn't feeling well at all. And the same was continuing and into Monday morning. Um, and I just what just was so tired from all the nonsense over the weekend and just was still feeling really poorly. And so I had um, ultimately had decided that I would have to miss the day at work and just work from home um, because I was just spending you know too much time um, dealing with all the, the things. Well, I needed still to go out, um, do a quick bit of shopping, and so I um, ran out to the local store, what I call the He Bodega. You know, Bodega is any place that sells stuff, and um, it's Fred Meyer, and I used to call it Freddy the Jew, so now it's just the He Bodega. I hope you're not offended. Anyway, uh, I, I uh, came to the local Fred Meyer here, the He Bodega, and I parked over here in the kind of the employee section of the parking lot because uh, the entrance is here and I can just slide over there so it's not a big deal um, and I didn't encounter anybody in the parking lot it's much like what you see here there's not much in the way of people parking they usually fight for the spots up here um, and so I parked and just kind of nodded in and got my goodies a couple of things of water and some perishables and came out to the vehicle to discover that my well my, my tire had been knifed the right rear tire had been knifed so some, somebody decided that I, I didn't need to to go anywhere that day. And so I considered my options. Um, I have a spare, uh, of course, and uh, also have AAA, of course, I'm that kind of guy. And um, considering what to do, it wouldn't take but a few minutes to change the tire, and yet uh, I just didn't feel up to it. I could have called AAA and waited, but I have perishables, perishables in the car. And I think, well, there's a discount tire located over here in the same parking lot. Um, some people questioned whether that might have been a marketing move, but I, I don't think so. It's across the parking lot, and they're fairly busy anyway, which leads into part of the story. And so I decided in my um, infinite and inimitable wisdom um, to just go very slowly back this da back alley here, all the way over to Discount Tire, and see what they could do to replace my tire, and maybe I could just calm myself for a moment. <clears throat> well, because of the Cranani, you know, things run differently here, and at the Discount Tire Shop, they've got right here where my mouse is pointing, there's a little tent right there, and that's a check-in place, and you can come in either from here or here. Uh, and check in, and they'll tell you, you know, blah, 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 and see what you need, and you'll park in one of these spaces. They'll come out and assess your deal, see what your damage is, and then get you going. 
Uh, so I pulled into this spot right here, this number three spot right here. And in doing so, um, <clears throat> uh, waited for the guy and he came out and, um, you know, he was trying to be all salesman kid and I'm like, dude, I'm just kind of not in the mood, right? I've had a really rotten day already and I just want to get out of here. And so, you know, g give me some options. How much for like the cheapest tire you got and then how much like what, what's a stupid deal in a set of tires, right? So, um, yeah, and so where am I at on the tread? So he tells me where I'm at and uh, I probably could use some new tires. Um, so he kind of gives me some options and I, you know, kind of choose that middle ground. They give you good, better, best as they are want to do. And I was expecting this. So I'm like, all right, how long is this going to take? And he's like, well, it only takes about 30 minutes to do the work, but we, it's going to be three three plus hours before we can get you in. I'm like, oh, you're kidding. And so, I, you know, it's just like, goodness gracious. So um, I don't know what to do. And, I, you know, I'm not above trying to bribe him, but I didn't. Um, but here, so I just said, you know what I'll do? I got perishables in the car. I'm not feeling well. I'll just call Uber and I got Uber uh, app on my iPad and so I'll just get them to come pick me up and it's not but it's less than three miles to my house it'll be cheap less than 10 bucks and uh, I'll get me taken care of so I do that uh, and Uber shows up and the guy shows up and he parks right here right next to me um, all right so he does that and uh, he's helpful and we take some perishables and we put them in the back of his car here and uh, I get in the back of his vehicle here he is uh, in his he's parked head in here and uh, so those are the vehicles here. So he's in here. I get in here and another vehicle comes in here. Mistakes. Uh, and they come up to this tent and as they're approaching it, uh, apparently she mistakes the gas for the brake, steps on the gas and the more she wants to stop, the harder she steps on the gas and I guess panics. So she hits the tent and it comes in this way. And I suppose if I do this and am very careful with how I do this so as not to give up too much information. Do, 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 do. I guess I can show you this right here. Grab this, bring it over here. Uh, this is a password protected file. This is actually the um, accident report from the Washington State Patrol. All right. I've been warned about doing this from lawyers and stuff, but I'm not. I mean, it's all true. And, you know, um, when we go to get the settlement, I mean, same story I would tell them. It's exactly what I said. So here's the uh, discount tire. Here's the employee area. Unit three is my vehicle. I don't know why they put it in black because it's actually white. Uh, unit two is the Uber vehicle and unit one is the offending and at fault vehicle which comes in here. Um, cannot uh, manage to control the vehicle. Uh, hits this vehicle really, really hard uh, and then continues to push on it so hard it slides down the side comes over here, jumps over here, goes around the corner, drops the transmission, uh, and I'm left um, hit really hard. Well, so um, as it uh, happens, then, um, uh, so uh, cops come, obviously, and uh, within five minutes, this has um, hit me, and that's so I start, uh, I started vomiting. Uh, and um, cops said, hey, do you want the aid wagon? Now, uh, you know, I should have taken that clearly, but I'm not thinking straight. I got hit really hard, kind of blacked out actually for a minute um, and uh, just vomiting. And they're like, hey, get the aid wagon. And I'm like, well, I got perishables in the vehicle and uh, I just want to go home. So um, then the, um, what do you call it? The, the employee hears the commotion, of course, and comes out. And when he realizes that it's my Uber that it's been smashed, he's like, oh my gosh, dude. He comes and gets me a glass of water or a you know, bottle of water. He's like, you just need to go home and take a nap because I'll tell you what, I'll just get you in right now. And so um, we, we worked it out. So I got a new set of tires and he gave me a crazy deal on them. And he put me in like next. It's still going to be about 45 minutes an hour. And so I'm like, all right. So um, I tell the cops, no aid wagon. Um, because I was going to have uh, Uber get me another Uber to take me home. And, I, you know, they're not going to do that. In fact, they still didn't refund the charge. <laughs> it's just another story. Um, so, yeah. Um, so they do the car. I get home. But I realize I got dinged really hard. So. Next day, I show up at work. And um, I'm moving real slow like a 90-year-old man. And I'm just like, bah, kind of in a daze. Can barely move around, can't do much, and so I'm like, yeah, I gotta go, um, you know, get a get a doctor, uh, visit the doctor, and I do that, and um, so I start looking for, <laughs> you know, an ambulance chaser. I'm thinking, well, uh, the best um, <clears throat> best thing I can do with this is at least, you know, try to 
make sure that I get protected because it was a similar situation. I was rear-ended in an automobile collision in um, Los Angeles about 25 years ago. And I didn't really realize, um, yeah, concussion for sure, Jay Armstrong. So, so, and that's the thing. So I didn't really realize in the one 20 years ago, right, that how badly I was damaged. And so I got an attorney then, you know, uh, basically they get, they get a third, your chiropractor or whatever gets a third. And then, um, the attorney gets a third. So I got about, I don't know, you know 3,500 bucks, something like that. It wasn't a lot of money. And, um, you know, at the time it seemed like, well, it's, it, you know, covered my car and loss and that sort of stuff. But the thing was, is that um, the uh, long term result of the damage was it began starting a series of trouble in my lower back that ultimately then required surgery about a decade ago. Um, and so I had an L5S1 lumbar laminectomy to uh, repair a synovial cyst. And um, that was really difficult, very painful. Uh, and that is sort of where we're at now. So what's, what's happened? So I go to the doctor and, uh, on Wednesday uh, and I can't, I try to get in as soon as I can. My, my primary care is unavailable. So I go to, um, a second person in, in the same system and she's actually really nice and, um, takes a look at me and I wasn't aware of how big a shot I'd taken to the head. Actually, I didn't realize I had a concussion and she was walking me through the, the mechanics of the acts of the collision, what I realized, right, is that I had gone from um, the back uh, seat, I was turned and twisted in a very compromised um, situation. So I was like sitting at an angle, turned to the right when we got hit really hard. And so it actually had driven me uh, off the seat into the door and the window in the back of the driver's seat, um, uh, his headrest. And so I found myself actually in that hole, right, on the floor. It knocked me completely out of the seat in, uh, into the window, banged my head really pretty severely and then on the floor. So um, there was actually a moment of, of blackout, right? I wasn't even aware. And so I looked up to see this vehicle shooting across the parking lot, except for, you know, smashes and drops its transmission. Um, so there was a, a, about a second and a half that I really literally have no memory of. It just got knocked out of me. Um, so I wasn't aware of how, um, you know, th th that damage, I the the, um, the severity, right? And what I began to realize over the following days is, is she indicated right away, the doctor, that I had had a pretty severe concussion and immediately wrote me out of work for a week um, based largely on that, not, not just the physical injury to the lower back, um, but from the concussion. She's like, you need cognitive rest. And I'm like, cognitive rest, what's that? Well, I didn't realize, um, in fact, um, until later that uh, when I was trying to like think about stuff and I uh, was trying to get ready for a stream, and I, I realized every time I try to think and follow along, uh, I, my head would hurt, right? Like it's it literally like I had bruised in my head and that's what a concussion is. And so I, I didn't realize that was a thing. <laughs> and so I needed rest and, I, and how much it was. Well, um, so the, uh, the doctor then uh, had ordered an MRI to take a look at um, potential damage to the lower back. I also had uh, quite a bit of swelling in lower back, middle back, and across the shoulders and the neck area. Three, I mean, I, three areas that were um, all compromised as a result of this turning, twisting motion. Um, and the primary concern, of course, is that I've had this previous surgery, and so I've got this um, cage uh, at the L5S1 um, where there should be a vertebrae, right? There's they kind of built one there. And um, so uh, there's, there's concern about that, and there's a lot of pain uh, associated with that. And so she had ordered an MRI to go uh, to look at that. And I asked, um, well, so then, um, uh, so I'm waiting in the MRI um, for them to call for that. And then over the weekend, um, starting about Friday night, uh, began getting um, a series of, like I call pocket headaches, or, um, you know, like these little spike, very localized headaches, sometimes more than one at the same time, and short term, but um, pretty intense. Just little like explosions in my head about the size of a golf ball, just going boom, boom, boom. It's like, what the hell is going on? And then um, on in my facial area, um, I started getting some inflammation um, and pain. Um, then there was a pain that went um, from my neck, right about the midsection of my neck, up behind my ear, through my ear, and it felt like there was hot oil pouring through my ear and like a diminishment of hearing. Behind my eye, uh, into my head, it was extremely painful, just killing me. And so um, it really felt a lot like um, the description of, I mean, essentially is following that nerve line of the trigenital nerve. 
um, going through there. And, and so I didn't know the process, the mechanism, whether um, through um, the collision or because I've got some you know, dental stuff going on, that w whatever occurred, it was so, such intense pain that I wanted it just to be over. I, I wanted death instead. And it was so bad that um, I, I needed to go to the hospital, to the ER. I, I couldn't drive myself. I was having blurred vision. Um, so uh, Brian Hattery uh, is local. And so I called him and said, hey, man, are you available? And he was here in like five minutes. So God, thank you, Brian. And zipped me down to the hospital. And so I get there and go in the ER. And uh, it was um, a disaster, right? So I get in there and they, I wait for, I don't know, an hour and a half, something like that. And um, there's all kinds of crazy people in there doing, you know, you know what, ER, hospital ERs are like. It's just, you know, there's a wide variety of people and everybody wants service now. And my head is just killing me. And um, sensitivity to light. And so I just, I've got a shirt, a, a shirt on over a shirt. And so I just cover my head up and I'm just dying. They finally come and get me and take me back. And uh, the, the gal that sees me as a PA, and I've never had a problem with a PA before, but she's just instantly like... Um, She's just one of those SJW types that, again, I, and I, I don't judge people for what they believe. It's how they behave. But it is that behavior that, oh, my gosh. And, and, and here is something I probably should have mentioned before that I should have led with um, to make this narrative really work, which is that um, throughout my life, one of the things that I've noticed is that the closer that I draw in my relationship to dad, the more it tends to polarize people around me and their reactions to me. And I, and I realize that it has often less to do with me than it does with dad. And there's something just about this glow that gets in you. Um, this, uh, I don't know, and, and we would say at this point, um, you know, that it's your vibrational, right? It's your frequency. Whatever frequency you're vibrating at is going to um, attract certain people and then it's going to push others away. And I've noticed this throughout my life, even before I had a way to elucidate it as terms of vibration or frequency or anything like that that made sense in a way that I think we do have a pretty good look at it now and, and have a, uh, a better sense of what's happening. But I just noticed that there was this reaction, right? People just have this like visceral, instinctive reaction um, sometimes to me and again I realize it's not really me it's, it's what I would say what's in me and and that being um, you know the closer I get to dad uh, and that sort of light shines out of me or whatever right it, it is um, that's what I you know that's what um, they're responding to and so um, I see it certainly more and more these days and especially as society becomes um, increasingly polarized um, where they are taught to believe and programmed to believe that anyone who believes differently than them is their enemy. And such that it's become such a cult society that, I mean, if you um, deviate from the mainstream groupthink by even one degree, they'll kick you right out, right? You could be the hardest, most affirmative action, social justice warrior, but if you believe in Second Amendment, you're right out. You're an extremist. They'll they'll pitch you right out. And and so we absolutely see, and I've been ringing the bell on this for some time, right? The, um, the increasing um, use of inflammatory language in the media, extremist is now the word, and soon we're gonna see domestic terrorism um, to describe those who do not accept the mainstream narrative as a legitimate story because we know that they're lying to us. And the more that they uh, jump up and down about um, fact checking the more i mean me thinks the lady death protests too much it becomes very clear and very obvious what's going on right you can't keep your story together and you're changing it so often and you've got to contain you got to control that story and the only way you can do it is by controlling people who are saying it's bullshit and it is bullshit and so um this is their sort of reaction so now i come back to the hospital right this gal just has a visceral reaction to me she um she doesn't like me and um, she doesn't like anything about me. She doesn't want to talk to me at the outset, and, and I can tell it. And um, she's trying to, you know, d do a quick assessment and do triage. And um, she sees in my file that I had been there, um, you know, a year prior, um, Christmas last year, uh, so about eight months ago, I guess, um, when I had um, kind of an abscess in, in one of these uh, broken teeth. 
and, and when I presented that time, I absolutely knew what was going on, and I said, you know, here's what I'm having. Well, I did have, again, some inflammation in, in my face. There was some swelling there, uh, but uh, she basically didn't even, she took a, like a two-second look and, and looked at the record and said, oh, she made this uh, assessment that she thought um, I had a toothache, and I was coming there for a uh, drug-seeking behavior, right, that I was coming there to get some, you know, oxys or some shit. So she writes me a prescription for like 10 oxys, won't even fill them there and says, you know, just it'll take you, you know, just get out of here. Basically, she just, she wanted me gone. She didn't want to hear me. She was trying to, you know, I kept trying to say, you know, close head injury. Uh, we have a collision here, an automobile collision, and I've been referred for an MRI, but it's the weekend and the MRI hasn't happened yet. And so um, I'm having these um what essentially are um, closed head injury signs that are very bad. I'm having these cluster headaches. I'm having um, blurred vision, double vision, difficulty concentrating, difficulty focusing, personality change, um, a variety of things uh, that should be, they, they should have gotten me into imaging immediately. And instead, um, she made an assessment. She made the this determination that this, I don't know, 25 year old um, product of uh, the, nanny state that she knew better so she sent me home and I was at this point just had had it I know that going off is not going to do any good now I'm stuck at the hospital I got no car uh, I'm not going to call Brian again to come get me come on I can't call Uber because now I've got a thing with Uber right I've been injured in the back of their vehicle and their insurance is looking at me sideways they're not going to give me a lift I don't know what to do exactly. Um, so I start walking, and uh, eventually I realize my back is just hurting so much that it's about four miles home, and I should have been able to make it no problem. I just my back was killing me, and so I downloaded the Lyft app and <laughs> took a Lyft home. Um, and then I thought, well, geez, you know, I, I got this MRI scheduled, so I sent a message to the doc and I said, hey, um, so we've got this. Um, you know, now that everything is online um, and they're sharing all their medical information with everybody and their dog, at least you can, you can access it, at least some of it, and send messages. And so I sent a message to the doctor and said, hey, um, I've had this experience over the weekend. I went to the ER. Um, I had a poor experience there, but um, I think that we may have an escalating situation um, with the neurological side. Uh, on the MRI that you've scheduled, can we add an encephalatic view? and see if there's anything we should be concerned about there because the last thing I want is to have long-term, you know, personality change and um, drooling a lot, you know, and unable to remain continent. <laughs> and I like my brain. It's not, it's not perfect, but I like it. it. I've been me for a long time and I'm not ready to be anybody else. When it, prior to my surgery a decade ago, they gave me enormous, I mean, like probably illegal um, quantities of Neurontin, Gabapentin. And it caused personality change. In fact, it caused a terrible um, disorder of, uh, it took me years to, to really reclaim uh, much of my personality was bad. I, I recommend don't doing it. It's a nerve blocking agent. And of course your brain is a bundle of nerves. What do you think is gonna happen? They're trying to give it to me this time. I'm like, no, no, not having any of that. In any event, so I'm like, okay, I got the same MRI thing. So uh, I messaged the doctor and I said, hey, can we add um, an encephalotic view and get some headshots going? Not the Kennedy style, but. <clears throat> so uh, she's like, well, we'll see. Yeah, that doesn't that seems reasonable. We can see because she was concerned as I was about those um, those symptoms. And she was as unhappy as I was, just that the very basic idea that um, the local hospital here, uh, ER, had just sent me packing. Well, um, so I'm like, okay, I'm going to wait for this MRI, and we're just going to add this shot. Well, I don't get a call, and I've got um, a follow-up appointment with, um, with the doctor to, to review the results of the MRI that I haven't yet had. Uh, also, on Monday, this, now we're a week out, um, from the collision. Well, um, when I met with the attorney um, initially, you know, I said, I, I don't know if you identify as an ambulance chaser, but I'm, you know, kind of looking for one, I guess. And, and so I was just like, I need to assess the damage, and I certainly want to make sure I get taken care of here. I'm not, you know, trying to get anybody's pockets, you know, uh, unethically, immorally. I'm not, you know, um, going to fake an injury, but it seems like I have been, um, you know, damaged, and I just want to make sure that I'm covered. I want to get back to where I was. 
Uh, and it's not often the case, right? Ambulance chasers um, will have um, a chiropractor uh, that they work closely with, that they're in bed with, and they, um, the chiropractor jacks up a bunch of, uh, put, puts up a big bill um, real quickly uh, so that the attorney can then present that to the insurance company and say, you've damaged my client, we want a settlement, blah, 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 so he can get you a quick settlement. That's how it goes. Um, and I'm aware of this, so the um, so the attorney recommends a chiropractor. I go over there, and um, it, just in the waiting area, clearly they're a um, it's a mill, right? They're going through it as quickly as they can. Um, they're treating their clients poorly. He um, very um, uh, well, not my not my kind of place, right? Um, and, and certainly not the kind of place that I think I'm going to get the kind of healing attention that I want, the the kind of um, intention that I want. But um, I got to admit, the guy does, you know, the first session, I felt a little bit better, a um, little bit relieved after just the very first session, but he was moving at a pace I was uncomfortable with. And what made me even more uncomfortable was he um, tried to play this as he's like, well, how did you come to, you know, get referred to my office? And I said, well, this attorney um, sent me here and indicated, and he, oh, really? Well, oh, how nice of him. And he, he, then he, and so I was like, no, I get it. I get that you guys are, and he, and then he really tried, he really tried to make it seem as though they, they had no relationship other than just this casual, like, oh, I know of him, and they, he sometimes sends me clients. I'm like, dude, don't play me. Man, I'm the bait, not the mark. You know, that's not, and so, like, no, you're not going to be dishonest with me. And so Monday, I talked to the attorney. I said, I, said, I you know, had a couple of questions about his V schedule. He had some, a couple of things I was wanted to just get clarification on, and I wanted to... Um, you know, meet with him before I gave him the signed papers because, of course, he wanted me to sign um, client uh, retention papers. He wanted me to, re you know, sign a retainer for him the, when we first met. And I said, well, let me have my wife look at these. And then I saw him blink three or four times when he realized when I told him my wife had worked in the legal profession for 30 years. And he asked where. And I told him that she was at Foster Pepper for 18 years and um, Bogle and Gates for another 20. And those are two of the largest legal firms in Seattle. <laughs> He gulps and he goes, I'm familiar with him. I'm like, well, you wouldn't be in the same. I mean, if you weren't, you wouldn't, I wouldn't think you were an attorney. I think, you know, you're a complete liar. Well, in any case, so I wanted to get his, um, I, w I wanted to get his reaction, um, the attorney. And he kind of, he did kind of fumble about a bit. And then when I indicated to him that um, I had visited with the doctor and um, it seems as if this is not just a simple case of um, some chiropractic care, but I'm actually going to require um, some attention and that there is some concern about long-term damage uh, to the previous surgical area. Um, and, you know, he, he starts gearing up and then I say, I just give him that, you know, this, so this is your opportunity, right? I'm just going to give you this opportunity that if, uh, if this is more than you'd anticipated, right, if this is um, more complex uh, a case, uh, than you had in mind. This is your opportunity to bow out gracefully. And he immediately did. <laughs> Are you surprised? Not me. Uh, I called his number and he didn't like it. And so now I'm like, oh God, what am I going to do? And so I, I got home and um, and I'd already had, again, just had this, it was just one thing after another. And um, oh, and then I found out, I got home. And then, so I'm waiting for the, um, I'm waiting for the schedule of the MRI. And no, I guess this actually happens in between. So I'm trying to keep the narrative on point here. And so um, now I got to find an, another attorney. I'm like, I don't know what to do and everything's falling apart and I can't get stuff scheduled uh, because there's this insurance thing, right? So normally what would happen is that there's a case number, right, which is assigned and I have that. There's a case number with the Washington State Patrol and you have an incident. And so normally what would happen when you go for medical care, instead of putting it on your insurance, they, they assign it to the case number. And then once they have an at-fault party, then whoever is responsible for the bills gets to pay all those bills. And, that's, and it's worked that way forever. It's not, un, not uncommon, not unusual. And um, so I gave the case number to the um, you know, doctor's office when I went for the visit, blah, 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 did all that stuff. And um, for some reason, they kept trying to assign it to my insurance. And of course, my insurance kicking it back like an MRI. They're like, we're not going to do that. So, but they didn't tell anybody. That's the thing. They didn't tell anybody that they didn't. They didn't approve the MRI. And so, I get to, uh, I get up to the date of the follow up appointment with my doctor to follow up with the MRI. And I'm like, but we we never done it. So I sent her a message going, what's going on? Are we like, we don't have an MRI. We don't have an image to to talk about. Am I still coming? So she. They hadn't even told her, so she had to find out what was going on and discovered the night before our follow-up appointment 
um, that they had the insurance had, uh, or the, they had canceled it because they didn't have an insurance coverage. I'm like, oh my God. So I went to the appointment anyway, and we talk, and um, that was yesterday, Friday. And I'm um, going to reschedule it. Um, blah, blah, blah. We try to do a peer to peer, the whole thing. They're not, insurance company isn't answering the phone. Um, finally, I get a call yesterday. Um, yeah, the whole thing is, okay, no, it's Thursday. I went for the follow up. Sorry. So it's been just a mess. We finally get, um, and so basically, yeah, the in, so everything that was scheduled for treatment um, got kicked off and they didn't tell anybody. They didn't, they didn't even tell my doctor that they had um, canceled um, the MRI, right? They, so um, with a closed head injury, like, are you kidding? And so anyway, um, I belabored the point. The doctor is actually, she's pretty cool. And um, so she got uh, back on it. So Billing called me yesterday and they're giving me the, you know, the song and dance about the insurance company. And I'm like, well, I don't know, how do I, man, it's like, now who do I talk to? Because the insurance company doesn't want to pay it. But of course it's not going on my insurance because they're not going to want to pay it. Because, but there's already an ad fault party. I've already got the Washington State Patrol in, uh, report, accident report. There's already an ad fault party. We already know there's three insurance companies already plus Uber. Right, we got three private insurance companies plus Uber corporate insurance. Somebody's getting paid, right? There's not going to be any problem with payment, but they don't want to pay. Um, so they just cancel everything. They don't even tell anybody. They don't tell me, they don't tell the doctor, they don't tell anybody that my, my imaging appointment's been canceled. So, um, yeah, basically they just tell you, you know, they'll t yeah, tell, you, just tell you you're lying, right? Um, but miraculously my doctor gets it and and weirdly this is not even my regular doctor my doctor's pretty good but this new doctor um, who i only got because uh, my doctor wasn't available that day um, she went to bat and she um she threw it to my insurance company that um the new accident um, was partly on under their coverage and it was a injury of an old accident that's the concern with the lower lumbar um, and they have a moral and legal responsibility to cover the cost so even though it's supposed to be covered with the accident she got <laughs> she harangued my insurance company to cover it and so they've actually rescheduled it for Monday so I'm going in Monday um, for that lower um, back MRI and then I talking to a doctor and I'm like actually I have more concern right now both are a concern but a more concern is actually is the closed head wound um, what's going on in my head now it's not as bad as it was last week but that's still a concern you never want to leave a close hand injury. And, and this is the part that I was just beside myself with is I'd been like when you go to the doctor, right? They very specifically ask you, in addition to your coverage, is this the result of a, a work job site claim or a motor vehicle injury? Is this a result of an injury claim? Uh, because again, typically what they do is they'll put it on a case number and assign everything to that. And that's just how it works. And so the fact that they would specifically ask the question, but then not take that information, try to run it through my insurance. And then even for this last visit, they just had to make me self-pay. They took me off the insurance. They took my insurance off so that I could self-pay. Um, so off the get reimbursed for that and I gave them a credit card number for an MRI not kidding well they're not going to run it you know, hopefully uh, because we, again we already have the party so then I uh, but yeah so this has been a nightmare and then so the in, so uh, attorney then what again um, somewhat miraculous my wife mentions hey there was a guy um, that uh, we we hired and again it's only 99% of lawyers to give the rest a bad name right the reason that um uh, you know, when attorneys fall off cruise ships, the, the reason that sharks don't eat them, it's just professional courtesy. You'd think it's because they taste bad, but no, it's just professional courtesy. So, but we actually found what I consider to be a decent attorney. He not only took care of Madeline's um, wrongful termination suit, uh, but he had found out that uh, I was in a situation where, um, again, it's just a long, one of these stories, right, where just um, everything went wrong, everything conspired against you. It's like nothing that you did wrong, but things are going wrong and so there was a situation like that that I was dealing with in terms of a um, unemployment claim that should have been paid and um, they uh, they just fought it just because that's what you do as a company they like me I still like them we were on the phone with the arbitrator saying we st I would still work for him and they would still hire me right um, but the circumstances are were such that that wasn't the, the case uh, and so the, but the judge as they typically do find found against me even though again legally they shouldn't have so he just uh, of his own volition again who ever heard, who ever heard of an attorney going, that seems unfair to me. I just did that pro bono. He just sent me an email and said, I took care of it. Right, to get me, I don't know, like four more payments of unemployment. It wasn't a lot. It was like 800 bucks. Um, so, I mean, but, it, but he didn't ask for anything. And it mean, I didn't even ask him to do it. He just did it. I was like, wow. So anyway, she tells me, why don't you call Matt and see if he knows somebody. And as 
I, you know, again, I wouldn't say the only ethical attorney I know, because again, he's an attorney. So, I, <laughs> but, but he showed us something, and so um, I, I did. I called him up and I said, um, I was just called his office. I said, hey, you, you successfully won a case for my wife a couple of years ago, and um, I wondered if you could refer me to somebody. Um, and here's the situation, and then. Um, she got off the phone, came back, and Matt picked up the phone. And he's like, hey, Baldini. And, um, and, and he remembered uh, all about us, right, what we were doing at the time and that we were going to build this bus and move to um, Uruguay, and he was all excited for us. And then, you know, I, he's like, what's up with that? I'm like, oh, God, the world went sideways. And uh, it was, and so he's like, that's a tale for another day, but we're doing a new thing, right? So I'm going to tell him about the poppy cult at some point. Anyway, um, so, uh, but I said, I said, here's the situation. Um, can you refer me to somebody? He goes, well, as a matter of fact, I've um, started to take on a few of these cases myself, uh, and uh, I'll take you. What? Yeah. Just then, I just um, send me over the info, and man, he's Johnny on it. Um, pff, like, are, are you kidding? And this guy's like, ter- like he, or, or, yeah, he's terrific. And so, again, thank you, Dad. Thank you, family, for your prayers. We're not out of the woods yet. Again, what I'm saying is that it, it seems like everything is aligned against us. But we have um, this other side, right? This, it's a spiritual battle. But we, we don't fight alone. All right? Um, one of the things that I noted... Um, Again, this this particular platform, um, the Screw U2 um, platform that everybody's migrating away from. And please understand that we do this. It's not about the money. We, no, nobody that I know that it does content creation does it for the money, except for a couple of people that clearly say they're doing it to be YouTubers. But for the most part, those of us in this community who choose to do this, you're sticking your neck out clearly, uh, in a variety of things, and um, especially in the truth community, right? People don't like this stuff, and then they want it to stop. So we clearly don't do it for the money. Uh, but um, the, this platform, it has the benefit that there are a lot of people here, and so you can reach more people. It has the, the drawbacks. Well, you know, you know what they are. And so um, one of the frustrations, as any content creator knows, is that you always get this garbage where people will, you know, you get the, the trolls show up and that sort of stuff, and people will report your channel. Or you get this um, content ID, they're going to charge you, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, they're going to put a copyright claim on your stream. Well, just like today, I often, um, it's a practice of mine, um, just I, I often do noodling, what I call noodling before the program, uh, which, uh, again, I didn't play music for, for the, the longest time. Whoops, sorry about that. I hope you didn't see anything you weren't supposed to. Whoops. Um, <laughs> awkward. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, I didn't play for the longest time, and um, Jason Lindgren, bless his pointy little head, um, at a time I was, was st- we were still really struggling. I had been saving up some money. I wanted to buy a new keyboard. I hadn't had one in forever. Um, and uh, so he... he um, sent me a little coin and helped me out to get a keyboard I was looking at. And so I got it, and it was broken. I mean, another thing, it was just like, oh, my God. And so uh, I sent it to repair, and they wanted more to fix it. Well, things started getting a little bit better. I still have that when it's in storage right now, but I got another one instead. And so I, um, I had been, um, hadn't played in forever. And so uh, I just used it as an opportunity to, I started, you know, adding it to the streams and just noodling beforehand, which is really just essentially improvisation. I just pull it straight out of my butt. It's a rectal extraction. I just come up with an you know idea as quickly as I can and explore it but it but it serves the purpose of doing two things one it sort of sets the mood for the program to follow and I hope that it does that but the other thing is it actually clears my mind because the nature of improvisational music and how you do it if you're not if it's not a planned thing you have to be in the moment you have to just sort of let go and be in that inspired moment and and that um, gives me the opportunity to just sort of clear my mind and not bring in any um, of my own stuff to the program. I can just sort of clear out and hopefully um, be connected and inspired with Dad and sort of do that, you know, collective consciousness, stream of consciousness thing um, that we also enjoy, right? So anyway, that that's the point of doing... Um, I'm doing noodling is to give you guys a, a, you know, it sends out, when I do it before the top of the show, it it sends out a a notification early, which is helpful. Uh, And, you know, it's just something that I enjoy, right? And uh, I did notice, again, part of the thing following the the collision is my fine motor skills have suffered, and I notice it's far more difficult. I'm not doing, I can't do the noodling as well. I can't play as well. It'll, it'll, I'm sure it'll probably heal up, hopefully. I mean, 
Wouldn't that be terrible? Anyway, uh, but all that being said, so I do this noodling before. Well, uh, I can't count the number of times. I probably can. It's probably been a dozen times or so. That some, mostly Korean, but sometimes um, all over Asia, Malaysia, India, China, um, Russia once, I think. Um, people have tried to put copyright claims uh, on uh, that noodling and claiming uh, that they, they ownership. <laughs> That's pretty funny. They don't give me a copyright strike. What they're trying to do is monetize um, your channel. And so they just take over the monetization and they say, uh, you know. <coughs> so I will say that I have successfully won every copyright challenge that has been presented to me because I can, you know, simply say not only is it um, original music, it's done in the moment. And I mean, what are you going to do? Um, and so I was really shocked when it first happened. And it just becomes an annoyance now. Um, and again, I've won every copyright challenge that has come my way. Um, however, uh, this is a, an interesting one that came in this week. Uh, I got a copyright challenge, and let's see. I'll, um, let's see how I want to do this. Uh, I want to show you this as best I can. So, uh, I got a copyright challenge, and it came in in Hindi. Uh, who is this? Um, this, yes. All right. So, slide this over here where you can see this. So, I got a copyright challenge. Um, uh, presumably this um, Indian non-stop Shiv, Jika Bhajan. Um, and um, here, if I go to view options, the uh, claim has already been handled. I, I won this case, but <clears throat> it's not, not a copyright strike. It's a claim, and what they're trying to do is, again, claim that they own part of that, part of your broadcast, that essentially that you're playing their, their music and they're going to uh, monetize it. Right, so um, that's what they're saying. Uh, that was the claim that they did that. Now I want to show you um, what that was. So uh, they also they give you um, uh, the cur courteously, unlike the ones that are um, if you have a uh, community guideline strike or something like that, they won't tell you what you did or where you said that. And when it comes to these, the copyright claims, they do give you a little timestamp and say um, this is where um, you aired and you can trim that out if you want to or you can um, say yeah I use somebody else's music there or um, you know you can you can fight it which I do um, so uh, dig this this is the moment so it was about a minute uh, there was about a minute that they claimed was copyrighted uh, and that they wanted to claim copyright material on but but I want you to dig um, that minute so they gave me the timestamp and it's not music it's, it's not uh, a musical selection. Uh, so give me just a moment here, and um, I'll do uh, this so that I can uh, do this, and I'll play you back um, this moment. And it starts at uh, about 44, 25 or so of Solar Scripture episode, um, was it, 8? And um, so this is, what, uh, this is what Wayne McCroy said in that moment. I want you to pay close attention to this. Let's uh, make sure i got enough volume here so you can hear very clearly um, what he says. Right, and that's just more evidence there. The foolish things of God are greater than the wisdom of men. And, you know, this is why uh, Jesus is a stumbling block uh, for other philosophies and religions and stuff as well. Because, let's put it this way, okay? Out of all the religious, uh, you know, methodologies and different philosophical movements and stuff throughout the world, basically Christianity is the only one that's saying, hey, you know what? Anybody could achieve this salvation or this, this you know, uh, atonement with God. And that is exactly the clip. It ends at 45.05. Um, that is exactly what um, they were claiming copyright on. Isn't, isn't that um, remarkable? I, I was stunned, stunned by that. Well, clearly I won that um, copyright challenge, so no, um, <laughs> no problem with that. But isn't... I found that um, I found that pretty remarkable that um, they would claim that as copyrighted material. Um, but I get these annoyance challenges all the time, and again, I'm just so done with YouTube, and for so many reasons, they're just they're ridiculous. They're a hassle. I've never talked to anyone um, there, um, but I I do um, in my inimitable style. Um, uh, I often um, jab back pretty hard. Um, in, in my loquacious manner. So, um, yeah, we have that. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to um, share with you this morning? There was a number of things that I wanted to um, to offer. 
Um, one of them being um, a couple of ideas here. Let's see if I can get into this mindset. All right, so Cami, so here's there's a couple of topics that that come up from time to time in the truth community that get people pretty excited. One of them, um, mud flood, right? Uh, and by extension, um, mountains or melted buildings, that sort of thing. Um, those can be pretty controversial. Um, they're interesting. Um, I think, you know, um, hard proof is difficult, but, um, but it's certainly mud fossil, that sort of stuff. There's, there's evidence. There's lots of evidence. Um, it's just hard to put the narrative together. And so, um, again, this, the, the kind of the continuum runs from the true believers who think everything is this to those who say nothing, right? So um, pretty hot topic right now. Um, one of the other hot topics, uh, again, something that got brought up in uh, Iron Realm Media last night um, is the sort of transvestigation thing, right? A lot of people get uh, heavily into the transvestigation thing until they think that everybody is a gender Connor and the wrong gender, uh, even people in our community. I know that uh, some people have claimed that uh, Bobby and Cammie Nodell are inverted gender, and if you've ever met them, um, you would realize how preposterous uh, a statement that actually is. Uh, so, uh, again, some people just get a little bit carried away uh, when it comes to some of these things, and, um, and, and that's true. Um, there are areas that people don't often want to touch, and again, for good reason. Uh, woo is one of them, uh, although people are some to different degrees, varying degrees, either into or put off by the woo. I'm kind of fascinated by it, and I have experience with it, although I make no claims about it. So I'm just like, it is what it is, and so I'm going to start doing uh, a new series on Rockfin called Tales of the Woo, uh, people's experiences with the unknown, right? So we got that. Um, but... Um, yeah, so uh, again, in, the, in these things like transvestigation and stuff, I'm fascinated by all of it, right? I don't throw any of it out. I don't um, accept all of it, right? But I, but I certainly accept that there probably is a there there. To just about any of these things that show up, there's almost always some nugget of truth in it, um, right? Or it wouldn't seem ridiculous because that's how they programmed to, to see it. Anything that seems ridiculous probably has some nugget of truth underneath it. All right. Well, um, again, my wife and I have been looking at a variety of different things and um, catching bits and pieces of, um, again, those, those, you know, truth in plain sight sort of things that, that come out there and lead themselves around. And so uh, I started, you know, just thinking. And one of the things that occurred to me, and so I'm going to bounce her all over the place right now. And so I hope that you guys can follow along because... These are somewhat parallel ideas. Again, I talk about sometimes the pachinko machine of my brain, and so I hope that I, I hope that I land on most of the things and bounce on these that I want you to. But um, part of it is again, um, this is how my brain works. It's it's this um, uh, looking at pattern recognition and pattern development, and that's sometimes why I see things that others don't, is because I see patterns where sometimes people don't. Some people would say it's pareidolia, right? So you think it, you you see patterns because you expect to see them, and so you make things appear like faces or whatever where they don't exist. But that's not necessarily the case. I do find patterns, and I've made a pretty good career of having a, a fair amount of ability to um, peek around the corner a bit into uh, particular markets uh, by doing this pattern recognition thing. And so I sometimes see things and catch it before uh, and where other people's don't. <clears throat> All right. No, we're getting there, right? And that's, uh, for example, that's just how I came came up with a premise, right, of using a multidisciplinary approach to science and came up with the, uh, the, the premise that um, in a similar way uh, to electricity and magnetism operating at right angles to one another, um, that the material and immaterial um, likely have that intersection uh, as well and is uh, a shadow or um, light body, if you will. Um, and I think there's validity to that in part because it follows along with um, the overall view of things. All right, so uh, a few just random observations here. So one of the things that I noticed, but this is one observation that goes with the rest, right, is um, in uh, the Awakening Project, again, if you're familiar with that, people who um, I, I wanted to know the, why some people wake up and why some don't, and I uh, assumed that there was probably some several correlating features that we could identify. Had people sent in a, just a basic brief questionnaire sort of thing, um, they did that, uh, about 300 people or so, 340 people did that. I still am not finished with it, my apologies. Um, I began this channel, right, and I just pff, began taking all my time, uh, and I'm not sorry for it still. Uh, but um, there are correlations between um, people in our community um, and um, certainly well beyond statistical probability, 
uh, very, very beyond statistical probability. But one of the things that uh, I, I think that we don't talk about, and I think if I did, if I sent everybody right now who had responded, if I sent you a standard um, depression index, everyone would score really high on it. And, and, you know, for good reason. I'm not saying you're all sad sacks. What I'm saying is that we've all gone through um, pretty severe trauma, right? A pretty severe trauma of having your worldview ripped from you against your will. And that everything that you once believed, you found out wasn't true. And it was done to you intentionally. And what's more, no one will believe you. And then they gaslight you into thinking that you're crazy because you can see what they can't. And it's so clear and it's so true and then when you meet others who see things the same way, and they got there from a very, very different direction, so it cannot be any sort of, um, well, it, it can't be a coincidence, right? And one of the things that we come out of very quickly, we're not coincidence theorists, right? We, we see the patterns. And so when you see the pattern uh, of people who have gone through similar things, right, you can correlate those things. Well, one thing is for sure I started noticing, right, is that uh, um, especially over the last year that I've been not well, um, and my wife has been uh, challenged with some health things for quite some time. She had two heart attacks uh, about 15 years ago within 30 months of each other that were widowmaker heart attacks. And this is even before we met um, that uh, should have taken her out and, and didn't because dad likes her, <laughs> right, and wanted us to meet so that we could be in love. And we are. So thank you, Dad. But um, that created all kinds of um, health problems, right? So she has a variety of things from um, diabetes to um, congestive heart failure to high blood pressure, just all kinds of stuff, right, that she has going on. And so I have to take care of her. And uh, I don't mind doing it. It's not a burden because I love her. But it puts her in somewhat of a fragile state. And there are some things that she can't do. The physical stuff like moving and packing and all those sort of things that couples often do together, she's unable to do. And I, again, I don't begrudge it because what she brings to this relationship is so much more than just that, that stuff, right? In any event, right? Um, but she does often help me see some of these things. And, you know, uh, I've mentioned before, she's on the spectrum. In fact, it was uh, me because of pattern recognition. I identified that she... Um, corresponded with patterns that corresponded she her behavior was corresponding with patterns that would be on the autism spectrum um, and we did eventually get her uh, diagnosed it was clear and unambiguous as she and, and she said yesterday this conversation happened she's like oh my gosh had I known my whole life right I mean she's a little bit older even than I am I called her my child bride but it's because she's you know hot she looks 20 years younger than she is anyway um but uh she's like had I known right my whole life what a different what a difference it's made just knowing just the last few years of knowing what a difference it's made in the way she approaches things because she had to develop these behavioral uh, solutions right knowing that she's, uh, eight, you know, neuroatypical, right? Not neurotypical and had to come up and thinking that you're just, you know, you're crazy, right? Or you're broken. Um, I th and I think um, this is a common feature um, to those of us in this community that we are being told unequivocally, right? Unequivocally um, from uh, society that we are broken, that we are crazy, we're hateful, we don't, we, we, we're psychopaths, we want you know, grandma to die uh, of the cranny because we don't care, right? And what's more, um, we're irresponsible. Um, we are, well, just, you know, n name it. Um, we're that, you know, everything but an uh, ethical guy. <laughs> I almost stepped in it. No, um, it's an old expression. Sorry. Anyway, um, you know, calling you everything but a good person, right? Um, we, we are now the target. We're, um, we're the bad guy. <clears throat> but um, I think very few people can go through that being uh, unaffected by it. Different people respond to things differently, and we always say that it's not what happens to you, it's what happens in you. Uh, but there is no question, right, that it is uh, a challenge. And I think um, one of the things that I noticed, again, with being ill, and this is where I was getting to, is that um, I can't keep up with all the things like I used to. And so some things suffer. And uh, part of that is um, things get a little cluttered around here. And, and the reason I know this is because we're trying to pack to get out of here, right? So, oh, don't hide Rob B. What's going on? Nemo, dude, easy. Come on, man. No, no friendly fire. Come on, man. What's going on here? Anyway, um, <clears throat> so um, where am I? Uh, yeah, so um, w w w things got a little bit cluttered, and I know this because, again, I'm trying to pack, and uh, oh, Nemo, dude, dude, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> Take your phone out of your pocket. <laughs> stop it. All right. <clears throat> um, 
uh, take your wrench away if you do. I mean, not because I'm mad, just because you, I don't want you butt pirating anybody. All right. <clears throat> anyway, so, um, but I noticed again, because I'm trying to pack, is how cluttered things got. And, um, you know, I, but I also had this OCD thing. So I had just areas of clutter and areas of complete, like, OC cleanness because, um, you know, I, um, you can't manage all of it, right? And so, um, but that leads to, um, and is, well, it leads to and is a sign of depression. And uh, I went snap, right? And I went, oh, geez, I bet, I uh, wonder how many, um, I wonder how many articles there are on links between um, depression and clutter. Interestingly, I did a, a quick uh, Google search and discovered most of the um, articles are pop sci articles and recent. There are some academic studies, but it should be clear that when you're depressed, you can't take care of some of those things. And some of the first things that happen that you stop taking care of are self-care, right? You stop showering as often. You don't take a care, good care of, your, uh, care of your appearance. You begin canceling appointments. You don't keep up with your friends, that sort of things, right? And uh, I can say, right, from my personal experience, I, I have um, gone through over the last decade um, some of the longest intractable clinical depression I've ever gone through in my life. And I was, you know, moderately depressed as a youth, um, got kind of out of it, was uh, somewhat manic thereafter, um, you know, managed. And then um, life uh, put me in a long state uh, of depression. It was very difficult to get out of, and I'm still not out of it, frankly, because I noticed, right, there's, so there's clutter, and there's this direct link between, you know, clutter and depression, um, and it, it's a sign, of, again, it's kind of a mental illness, if you will, it's, it's certainly a, a thing, but that clutter then makes you depressed, right, because, I mean, and if somebody looking from outside would go, well, of course you're depressed, look, look, look at the clutter, right, well, um, that was caused by the depression, but certainly when you see it, it does make you depressed, and you go, like, fuck, I need to do something about this, and so you want to, but you're it's hard to get started because you're depressed and then you don't do it. And then that lack of doing it makes you depressed. And then it's, um, it's a cyclical pattern. Um, thankfully, uh, I have ways to get out of that. And, um, but not always. Right. And, uh, again, there, but for the grace of God and, and for my relationship with you guys and my wife and, and my creator, um, I could be lost, but I certainly know that it's happening. And I know it's happening to many people in our community, right? That we are, um, under assault. And when you get depressed, it's so hard to get out, right? And um, they're creating this problem. And so if you just, I guess the note here, if you see somebody around you that's got a messy car or a messy house, don't beat them up, right? Ask them how they're doing. Because it's not a character flaw probably. What it probably is is depression. Just saying. Um. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> all right. So this idea then that, <clears throat> Many of us in this um, in this community have gone through trauma, right? Depression, loneliness, and we're um, <clears throat> corporately struggling with these things. One of the things um, that we don't talk about, and this is I'm coming back now to um, again one of these touchy subjects. And I set this up a while back. It is the TI, targeted individual, and there's a reason for that. Well, there's a variety of reasons for that. On the surface of it, just like all the other things, it seems freaking crazy. And then when you hear people talk who <clears throat> are self-described targeted individuals, no offense, y'all sound crazy as fuck. And I'm cautious on social media when I get people who are really pushed out as their pet agenda, right? Their pet rabbit hole. Um, because they are often very paranoid. And they, uh, But I, st I began noticing that they began to... Um, exhibit patterns of behavior. Now, I'd like to talk to David Marzinski about these patterns of behavior as um, relates directly to um, schizophrenia and psychosis because I am uh, not a psychiatrist. I don't play one on TV, but I have um, been a licensed counselor before. And I, I you know, have some ideas of what I'm looking at when I see it. And one of the things that I noted um, just recently in, um, is these, again, characteristic patterns of um, at least talking or typing, right, these posts that are very, very similar between people who have exhibited TI behavior or exhibit, um, who claim TI. Um, long, long, long run-on sentences, almost no punctuation, frenetic thought patterns, um, very short, unconnected, disconnected, disjointed thoughts. Um, 
and you, uh, again, a neurotypical person would immediately discount and dismiss that person as being crazy because on the surface it looks crazy. But if you have ever been um, bullied or targeted in any way, it, it does something to you. And if you imagine that some of the things that they say are true, electromagnetic warfare, that sort of stuff, and that there are vast amounts of evidence in terms of patents and um, uh, technologies that have been revealed that do these precise things and more um, in terms of you know getting in people's heads, fucking with them. Um, Absolutely could be done. So the, the, so the technology is, is certainly not, um, uh, it's, it's certainly not outside the realms of technology. Everything that's claimed by targeted individuals absolutely is possible. Everything that they say, as crazy as it sounds, is possible. But again, they sound crazy. But maybe it's because they didn't start that way. Maybe it's like the depression and the clutter. They're not saying they're targeted because they're crazy. They're crazy because they've been targeted. And it's a possibility. And one of the things that Russell Babbitt, as far as I can tell um, in chat here, uh, discussed uh, about a year ago on his channel, we had this conversation, right, is the possibility. <clears throat> and I introduced the, the idea, right, that um, logistically, one of the issues that I had with this idea, uh, idea of, for example, gang stalking, which is one of the things that the common factor uh, in targeted individuals, again, uh, an area of, ta of subject matter, which, frankly, again, I'm not really steeped in. I know it just enough about it to be dangerous. And to probably um, those things, because I noticed myself being in that category uh, to a degree, right? So, again, not, not paranoid, not crazy, but I certainly see some of these um, identifying characteristics that are consistent. Um, and, um, I, again, I don't know, I don't want to get too deep into this because it's a topic for another day, but I will say, I wanted to share this, that Cammie Nodell sent me a thing um, about, um, you know, again, one of the things that we've talked about um, numerous times, and certainly I have discussed it, if you go back to the very first episodes, two episodes of this series, Unintended Consequences, where I discuss <clears throat> um, the idea, um, some of the context of, um, in some uh, lectures from Aldous Huxley, and he talks um, specifically about the power of suggestion um, and the hypnotic state, essentially, that, that um, the culture finds ourselves in, this sort of um, social engineering by mass hypnosis, um, that it has um, certain aspects and certain characteristics that are consistent. And um, so if we go all the way back to that, right, what we find that there, there are these consistent things and um, certain percentages begin to appear, and uh, the Pareto distribution is certainly uh, apparent there. <clears throat> and we, we see, again, some of these uh, certain aspects that uh, become apparent across um, segments <clears throat> of, of people, right? And so certain things that are um, communicated. And one of the things in that discussion, right, is the, is the alpha, theta, beta, delta brainwaves. And um, a lot of people making a big deal about that, right? Uh, keep in mind, those are just the, the first letters of the Greek alphabet. It's like saying A, B, C, D. <laughs> Right? Um, it's not as big a deal. I mean, yes, there's, because they, it, like many ancient languages, they also have meaning. Delta has a meaning in addition to being a letter. And so there, there is some of that crossover there. But uh, again, be, before you go taking stuff too far, keep in mind that those are just letters of the alphabet, right? So A, alpha is like A, right? So it's the A wave and B, B beta wave, right? So anyway, but um, uh, delta is one of the, so we have a delta variant, right? Delta wave, that sort of stuff. But um, as, we, uh, as we go through this, right, one of the things that, um, that we look at is that different brain wave patterns occur at different frequencies. And the higher the brain wave frequency, typically, um, we see from individuals who have um, more active thought processes. I'm not going to say smarter. I'm going to say more active thought processes. But those people often do um, tend to test out higher on standard IQ tests and um, standardized tests of every kind. They typically do um, somewhat better, um, again, depending on uh, the nature of the test and what they're testing for. The point here being... Right, is that certain people um, tend to vibrate at a different frequency. I think we can all agree with that, right? Just your brain waves have, have vibrated different frequencies. And there are some people that, you know, uh, people don't like the word retarded. Well, that just means slow, right? 
And some people, you look in their eyes and you can tell that they're definitely running a bit slower. Right? Their, their CPU is definitely not overclocked. <laughs> Woo! All right. So um, my point, I, I, I don't mean to belabor the point. But what Canning suggested, right, um, is th that, is it possible um, that by dialing in, right, on people uh, and being, you could easily use any kind of simple antenna to tell uh, what um, frequency rate people were operating at. You could walk by them with a very simple um, dipole antenna. You don't have to use a quadrupole, just a simple dipole antenna. Uh, attuned to the proper frequency would tell you um, what um frequency somebody was operating at. If you want to say, um, let's go back to um, the movie uh, Dr. Sleep, The Shine, right? You want to say you got some shine on you? Is this possible? Absolutely. Right? I think it's, uh, especially if we look at this um, frequency thing, right? It's it's absolutely possible. But not only, as um, Cami was suggesting, right, can they identify people based on the frequency with they operate? Well, the easy as pie. Um, ba based on the technology that's available. But here's what I'm going to suggest, far more nefarious than that. If you want to go back to this idea of um, wave interference and wave theory, if I go back and introduce um, some of these topics, right? Um, one of the things uh, about it is with interactive um, waves, you can uh, cancel things out, right? And so basically the premise is if you introduce two waveforms that are in phase, uh, well, uh, the same amplitude and frequency, and you introduce them out of phase from one another, what they do is they cancel each other out. Or you can at least, at minimum, break them up, right? So you can use um, interference, uh, interfering wave patterns to break up um, one, of the, one of the waves and use uh, constructive or destructive waves. Well, what would be very easy to do Right. And again, I'm basing this on technology that I already know exists. Right. They, they can already at a distance. And I say they just understand what I'm talking about there. Right. It, it, it military industrial complex in this case can already at a distance um, get a pretty good shot of your DNA. Right. Um, so they can target uh, certain aspects and they could certainly dial in on your um, on your frequency. But it's not just a it's not a sinusoidal wave. Right. It's actually you look. Uh, again, I would say um, ultimately that um, because matter manifests itself as a waveform, you look like this, right? You have um, you have an appearance that is um, manifesting like this. It's specific and individual and unique to you. Uh, but that could easily be read if you had the technology. You could read that and then target it. And you could do exactly what, say, noise-canceling headphones are, which is to sample the ambient sound. You sample everything around it, and then you flip it out of phase, and then it cancels it. Well, you would do exactly this to a person. You'd take their energy reading, and then you'd flip it out of phase and feed it back to them, either 180 degrees out of phase and just shut them down, or if you didn't have enough energy to do that completely, you'd just do it, uh, again, at an uh, obtuse or oblique angle, 45 degrees, say, as strong as you can to disrupt their thoughts and to sh cause all kinds of havoc. You could wreak all kinds of havoc with one individual in a room using 5G or any technology, any microwave type technology, um, by um, sampling, evaluating their frequency, um, and then um, using a harmonic frequency, sending that back at them. Um, you could fuck them up really hard. Ab easy as pie. And um, so I'm suggesting that um, that is part of what um, uh, the TI phenomenon is uh, and that it is a thing. There is a there there. I'm going to suggest that. Another random thing I'm going to suggest, and this is um, probably where I'll leave you uh, these couple of ideas here, is one, one of the things that I noted, um, with, uh, one of the first things that I noted in the Awakening Project is um, one of the things necessary uh, for people to awaken is time to do so. You must have uh, an appropriate uh, amount of time to consider deeply these things and to make do rational thinking. If you are busy, right, making a living, dealing with your family, trying to get laid, <laughs> trying to make money, um, you don't have time for any of this. And, and you already know that you're smart enough not to be fooled because you're a smart person, right? And so when somebody comes up with you with one of these crazy conspiracy theories, well, that's retarded. And of course, if, if that were true, I would know because <laughs> I'm a smart guy and I don't have time for that because it takes time to really dig in. And if you are curious, if they say something that piques your interest, you know, you do a quick Google search and Wikipedia assures you that those people are crazy and you can go on your merry way. No problem. 
right? Don't have to worry about it. And so one of the things that's absolutely um, consistent across the board is that for people who have made this journey, they must have enough space at the beginning to contemplate these things. Well, certainly in the last week or so, um, being off, I've had time as well. I now have, you know, again, I guess I would say some fewer responsibilities um, because I, you know, I haven't been going to work because of the, the injury. Uh, again, gave me the opportunity to think, and boy, is that dangerous, right? Running off in all these directions. Um, coming across little random bits and pieces in, um, in Scripture and going, oh, well, that's interesting, and connecting them together. One of those things being this idea um, several times in the book of Revelation, as well as uh, throughout um, Scripture, particularly in Psalms, uh, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Isaiah, um, there are, as well as Genesis, the idea uh, referencing to water as being living water, and specifically in the book of Revelation as it describes um, the throne room of God, that living water comes out from beneath um, uh, the throne and clear as crystal. It's the river of life that uh, water contains life. And as, of course, as I study water, uh, I am more and more convinced that, um, again, these two things are true. The two uh, essential components for life are water and sunlight. These two things are um, critical uh, elements. You must have those things. And so the idea of the river of life um, and water being this amazing thing that it is, it is the, one of the most phenomenal, supernatural, crazy things I've ever encountered, and I still haven't come to the end of it. I don't know when that will happen. It is mind-blowing. It's deep, <laughs> right? But so you have the, 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 the great deep, waters above, right? Um, waters above and below separating the deep from the deep, right? Waters from the waters to create this vast space in, in which we are. Right? The, but water is the critical aspect. And the other thing is sunlight. Even those um, things that live outside and away from the sun draw their life, their energy from either other things that interact with the sun or um, from the heat energy or some other form of energy that trickles down to them. Uh, so sunlight and energy. And it occurred to me, one of the interesting things, of course, in the book of Revel or Genesis is that um, the, the sun, the moon, and the stars, the luminaries, were not created until the fourth day, and yet light was created the very first thing. Let there be light. And so I consider, of course, that that light is the, um, the very beginning of the phenomena of the ether. Let there be this media in which electromagnetism can, um, you know, propagate. Let there be this media, and there was, in which there was light, and he saw that it was good. And um, if you take this idea, again, the um, Islamic story is that the reason um, the sun and the moon and the stars weren't made until the fourth day is that the light was essentially the glory of God, and it was so intense that even the angel said, whoa, dude, he's up. <laughs> right? Okay, interesting, but then I thought, I mean, as we look at the sun and I try to consider what it is, and it seems to be an intangible, non-physical object, which focuses energy and uh, redistributes it, and it um, defies some of the basic laws of physics, for example, the inverse square law, that we would imagine that since the sun seems to be the source of the heat energy that we get in the sky, we can tell that it comes overhead, and when you're in the direct sunlight, it's warm. So you would think the inverse square law implies, and the closer you get to it, the more intense that heat would be, except for what we discover is the opposite. The closer we get to it, the colder it gets. And in fact, the highest temperatures on Earth are in fact the lowest below sea level. The highest um, uh, temperatures are the lowest, the furthest away from the sun. So it's, um, it's interesting. Um, so again, uh, so I think, is it possible then that what we're looking at here is some sort of lens that literally is like the glory of God, the intensity. It says in um, uh, the, you know, the story of um, Moses, right, and going up to get um, the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, that uh, he wanted to see God's face, and God said, if you can't. If you do, it will blow you, it will literally blow you up, right? The best I can do is to have you look at where I've been. Uh, and you can see, and so, but it was like, people have trouble with that. It's like, well, what if he's, what if he's like the, you know, say face like the sun, right? So what if he literally is like face like the sun? Um, and if you got it close to it, it would blow you up. I mean, it would incinerate you, right? I mean, that's easy enough to understand if you got close to the sun, you know, hey, we're going to fly to the sun. Well, you can't do that. Oh, we're going to go at night. <laughs> no problem. Um, no, but uh, again, so what it, with this idea, right, that it is um, li literally like a lens um, uh, because you can't triangulate it. It's not really uh, a physical manifestation. It's, it's a, a, a trans-dimensional um, lens, um, if you will, uh, a transformer 
that um, takes the glory of God and his life and spreads it to us. Just as what we need, right? Um, and this is where you get, you know, sun worship. Again, it's the, the worship of the creation rather than the creator. And, but this is the glory of God, right, shining on. It's, just, it's a thought. That's an idea. But these two things are necessary, water and sunlight, the, the glory and the life. Right? And we, we need these two things in order to live. Um, lots of crazy thoughts like this. Um, I've been having all kinds of them. We'll get more into it and uh, dive in deeper, um, especially to some of these more technical aspects, because I think I can support these ideas with physics. Um, which, you know, pretty interesting. Uh, beyond that, what do I want to get to today? There was more, but um, I don't want to hold you up. It's already coming up on 10.30. Uh, I think I'll leave it there. I promised my lovely bride I'd uh, take her and get some uh, food this morning, so we're going to do that. We're going to uh, kind of hold up this week because of uh, my injuries, and so hopefully the head injuries will um, subside um, somewhat. I uh, do have an MRI scheduled on Monday. Um, that is for the lower back, but um, if we can get the um, we're still working on getting the other part of the insurance thing approved. So if we can get that, um, the other one approved, then we'll flip them and do the head shot first, uh, not, not Kennedy style, but we'll do a head shot first and then the lower back because the head is a greater concern, clearly. Um, if I had to, you know, uh, you know, be, um, X or whatever, Xavier in the wheelchair, but smart, I'd do that versus having a body and being dumb, I guess. Anyway, am I feeling better? You know, to some degree, not a lot. Um, a little less traumatic, but um, the frustration is still there, certainly. There's a lot of stuff going on. I, um, I continually need um, Dad's help to navigate through this, and to um, it's going to be um, dicey all the way through. Uh, I've been written out of work for another week. I'm sure they're not happy about it. They didn't even respond to my email yesterday indicating um, that it was going to take at least another week out. Um, and um, we're, we're still in kind of a wait to see what, what happens. So, um, but there is good news, right? I seem to have a decent attorney who's going to be hopefully on it. Um, hopefully I will get um, some of these things looked at and observed. So, um, but there's that, right? We still have these other two issues of the GI issues and the dental stuff that has to be addressed. So it's a, it's a nightmare. And um, again, I'm always going to be jealous for your, your prayers in that regard. Um, it's just as I get older, right, these are health issues that have to be addressed. And certainly as I want to do the poppy cult and uh, not be a burden, right, uh, to people. I want to be uh, healthy and um, able to be a contributing, you know, member of that um, group and society. So um, definitely trying to um, get my health and energy back. And um, anyway. I want to uh, also say again, thank you so much for cards, letters, emails, comments. Uh, super meaningful. Um, you guys keep me going. I, I, I'm terrible about forgetting. I keep meaning it. When I get an email, I'm like, oh, yeah, I want to make sure and thank that person individually. I mean, I know um, Clementine and Austin and, um, uh, but God, I got to introduce you guys to um, Donald Ray and the curly headed kid sometime. <laughs> Donald Ray, Don and I went to school together in. Uh, primary school all the way back and uh, he's got a very interesting story um, and a uh, long journey uh, bringing him back to dad and weirdly enough so he um, he and the curly headed kid his daughter um, they live in the same apartment that I live first lived in when I got married to my practice wife like I was like 35 years ago um, they live in that very same apartment it's, it's bizarre uh, and um, they're frequent listeners to the program and um, so hey curly headed kid Good girls get to do the dishes. That's why. <laughs> and um, so Don and Lynn, uh, thanks again for, for being a part of it. But um, again, the, just the community of people um, that send um, reassuring and encouraging notes. Um, David and um, Jonna, um, Janet, uh, Sue and Melanie, and um, you guys are just the best. Um, thank you so much for your continued encouragement and lifting me up. Um, it means more than you know. Um, it is so hard sometimes. You know, I'm not one to complain, and I don't tell you the story of this, these circumstances to, um, you know, to whine or complain. I'm, it's not my, it's not my intention at all. Just to go, oh my gosh, it's been nutty. And uh, but Dad has got it covered, right? So in, in every step, although it seems like again, how much more clear does it have to be that it's like we're um, spiritual targets? But but. Well, it's a spiritual battle. We are not fighting alone. And that's good news. 
and, and you're not alone either, right? We're all in this together. This is our family. And you guys have become my family. And I'm so grateful for that. And I can't wait to see so many of you um, at Flattoberfest. Super, super stoked for that. If you hadn't gotten your tickets yet, um, do that. You don't want to uh, miss that opportunity. Um, but make sure and do that. I'd love to see you. And uh, plan even to do, I, I think I'm going to try to do some uh, healing sessions there, personal one-on-one, -on -one, um, sonic and touch healing sessions. If you're into that, we'll try to arrange uh, for that. Um, very few, um, we'll have very, very few appointments available. Uh, but I'll probably will also do um, on the second day during the music thing, maybe a little noodling, but um, talking to Karen B about doing um, some sound um, healing stuff, general, uh, overall, like a sonic bath. I'm working up some cool stuff for that. And then uh, helping out Zach and Cammy with how the world works because that's the coolest, that's the coolest exhibit anywhere. <laughs> Nothing can compete with that. I don't care. I, I haven't seen anything yet that, that uh, measures up to that. So <clears throat> with that, uh, I just, again, thank you so much, guys, for being um, such a wonderful, uh, I'd say, part of this community. But really, you are the community, right? We, we don't really have a community without you. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it would be silly of me to say thanks for being a part of it. Thanks for being the community. You guys are the very, very best. Um, support those um, people putting out content. They're just people, right? I, I hesitate even to say, like, you know, content providers or whatever because we're just people, right? But we're your friends, and um, we're sticking our neck out, and we're doing a lot of um, extra effort, right, to help um, keep this community together, just like you are, right? Just like you are. So um, take care of those around you. Be good to those around you, those people who need it. And be good to those around you who don't deserve it, right? Even, even those on the other team, right? If you can, if you can, be good to them. Show them that we are not their enemy. We're not scary, right? What, what's scary is the world around them and, and um, trusting people who want you dead. That's, that's scary to me anyway. Um, I hope you guys have a terrific weekend. Um, you know, I keep saying I'll show up at some time here and there everywhere. I know I'll be back probably tomorrow morning for Ancient Wisdom um, right here. Uh, I am going to start breaking up the channel and uh, moving things to different places, but probably starting more material as well. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, and we'll have uh, more goodies there. Uh, I do still have um, I Do Not Consent stickers. Uh, if you're interested in that or anything, you can, of course, send me uh, contact. Um, unintended.consequences3 at gmail.com. Let me get that screen up for you here. Unintended.consequences3 at gmail.com. Oh, I didn't even tell you the great mail fiasco. Holy crap, that was a whole other thing about um, some shoes that my wife ordered and how bad the, the mail delivery is here and how many times they've screwed us. They, tell, they say it's stuff is delivered when it's not. Um, and um, just, I'm telling you, they're all lying to you, for one. For another, it was, um, I'm, I'm not going to do the whole story this time. Remind me later maybe to tell it. But um, a very clear example, I had set it up earlier, but a very clear example of how um, your energy in the world is offensive to those who are dialed in to the other side, right? So those who are completely dialed into this mainstream, they're, they're exactly the opposite of you. They, they, they want to be your enemy. And I'm not trying to turn you against them, but I'm saying you will absolutely see their energy is dialed against you. Um, and you don't have to say or really do anything. They, um, they sense it. And it's going to be more and more that way. And uh, again, what we're told in Scripture, whether you subscribe to it or not, I mean, you know, what it says is um, there's going to be a time when people uh, think that they're doing God a service to kill you. I, I think that's not too far away. We can see that um, pretty clearly that people are being convinced that you are their enemy. We know better. Uh, but, um, oh, and, the, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't again mention um, thanks to everybody uh, in the Iron Realm Media uh, world in the chat um, last Saturday um, for that amazing um, display of the power of intention and love. Um, and, I, again, I was in so much pain, and you guys helped um, mitigate it immediately and unequivocally, right? I, I did still end up going to the, the emergency room, but for the headache, not the dental pain. So in any case, um, yeah, you guys are the freaking best. I can't wait to see you guys um, at Flattoberfest. Please go so I can meet you. 
even if you don't like crowds. I'd love to. Oh, and uh, again, I would be remiss on this. Uh, I got advised that there is a meetup uh, tomorrow in Burien, Washington, Seahurst Park, about um, lunchtime. And so I think Dottie will be there. Um, and uh, if you can go and you're in the Pacific Northwest, do that. Uh, I'm going to try my best to make it. I may not, but I'm, I'm going to try. Uh, so Seahurst Park in Burien. Uh, around lunchtime tomorrow, uh, do your best to go because I'm going to, and if I don't show up physically, I'll be there in spirit, but if I can at all, I'll make it. All right, I'll find you a little outro music for the day, and I think I have something in mind, so hope you don't mind uh, with that, and I hope to see you, um, well, tomorrow morning. Uh, I'll be back for um, Freaky Freaks, of course, every morning at 4.20 in the morning on the West Coast on Rockfin Premium. Uh, get dialed up for the day. And um, then again, I'll be back Ancient Wisdom for a Modern World tomorrow morning, undetermined yet on whether we'll do um, on whether we'll do sola scriptura, sort of scriptural. Uh, let me see what's going on with that. Um, it kind of depends on just honestly how I'm feeling. I get, I get worn out um, pretty quickly, and there's a lot of stuff going on Sunday, and it depends on whether Globebusters want me joining them tomorrow. So um, we'll, we'll wait and see on that. I'm not going to make any promises. Um, with that, I'll leave you with this. Uh, more than I've ever seen. Um, circa, gosh, 1994, something like that. Hope you guys enjoy it, and uh, thanks so much for being here. I love you um, very sincerely. And I'll see you tomorrow in the funny papers, on the interwebs, or wherever we can find each other. Take care, guys. Dreams in